Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Isaac Olufadua. I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I have a master's, and I'm currently running my PhD program in public health. Uh, so, and it's really nice to see everyone here on this very important topic that addresses not just only health equality, but also talks about delivering global health care in, uh, in different settings, especially low resource settings. And I have here with me um, Dr. Wahid Aryan, who is a radiologist and the World Health Organization digital health expert, is also a United Nation, um, one of the United Nation experts who works, who works in, in terms of like digital health care and also works in terms of like works with low, in low resource settings, especially with doctors in terms of like delivering health care. My first question to Dr. Aryan. Uh, is first we have a situation where you, you became a doctor and a radiologist and you had to flee Afghanistan and to the UK during the Soviet Union crisis. So first is what inspired you to do this and how did your experience help you shape the Aryan telehealth innovation that you have today? Uh, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here. Hello everybody who is in the audience and uh, those who are watching. Uh, I'm inspired by the work that you do, the achievements you have. Uh, so you could answer that question yourself. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled here because growing up I didn't have mentors. So as soon as I got that invitation that there are, there's a young uh, world summit and uh, the young leaders are here, I absolutely couldn't resist not coming. Um, I was born in war-torn Afghanistan and grew up, um, my entire childhood was spent in conflict, running and fleeing and so on. So it's, it's uh, mentorship was something that I aspired to, I, I wanted to, and I learned a lot of the things by experience. Uh, so for me, that's really important to be here. Um, the important fact that I want to allude to is that we all find inspiration in different places. Most of us, we go through adversities in life. So what inspired me to become a doctor uh, is actually a, an accumulation of the experiences from conflict. Uh, born in 1983 during the Afghan-Soviet conflict, the first five years we spent hiding in cellars from the daily rockets and the bombs. And after about five years, when our family was separated, my father had fled the military service. He was in hiding in mountains. Uh, many of them you might have seen from the footage on TV. My mother was looking after us. The two happy memories that I have, one is being taken to a local park by my mother to have an ice cream with my cousins, and another one is my father kneeling down, giving me a big kite before him disappearing from our life. So that sort of loss, and then meeting him again after a few months in the mountains, that reunion exemplifies the life of those people who <coughs> live in conflict stricken by conflict, displacement. And after five years, for us to be together, like millions of other refugees in Afghanistan, we had to migrate to Pakistan. The normal borders were closed, so we had to take a very dangerous route through mountains, valleys, uh, and, and rivers, uh, traveling on donkeys and horses, because um, the, the, the road to the normal border was closed, and it had to be done at night. Any activity that was seen during the day the helicopter gunships and the jets would come in and attack. And we did come under the attack three times. We miraculously survived those attacks and we made it to refugee camp. Back in the refugee camp in Pakistan, like millions of other refugees, we were safe and we uh, were very happy to be together. But sadly, the conditions were absolutely inhumane. As a family of eight to 10, we were living uh, in a muddy room with temperatures rising up to 45 degrees with one fan. And we relied on the rations that were given to us by humanitarian organizations. Even the water that we received was in tanks that was brought to us every few days. We had to store a little to drink, some to use for cooking, and a little bit for cleaning. Within days, most of us got malaria, and it was within three months that I became very sick. I started shivering, had night sweats, lost a lot of weight. I was a walking skeleton. And that's when my, doctor took, uh, my father took me to the doctor. And he diagnosed me with tuberculosis. As you know, it's a deadly disease. Many children die from it. 
uh, across the globe, uh, especially in low resource settings. Uh, although my chances of survival was around 30 to 40 percent because I was so weak and malnourished, my father didn't give up on me. But it was actually during my interaction with a doctor who was treating me for a year or more than that that inspired me to become a doctor. So it's actually during those darkest times that my family, my parents were crying that they would lose their son and I didn't have much hope, I couldn't breathe, is when I became curious of how on one hand there is so much trauma, misery in the refugee camps. On the other hand, there is somebody who can heal people. Um, and that was the beginning of that curiosity. And he, in the end, he gave me a stethoscope and a medical textbook. I didn't know the words on it, but I loved the black and white pictures, and he told me that one day you may become a, a doctor. We spent the next uh, seven, eight years uh, in Afghanistan, again, um, hiding from the rockets and the bombs, and in 19, most of my education happened in Silas. But one thing I didn't do was lose hope. I always believed that I would be able to reach a dream of me becoming a doctor, despite seeing bombs, despite seeing rockets, and despite not knowing what normality is like for people. Uh, I would listen to BBC World Service and find out that um, actually people would sit around the table, they would eat and drink uh, as a family. And that's something, that sort of safety and, and the environment where I could go on to study was something I was aspiring to despite not knowing how to go about it. So the lesson that I learned was that we can find uh, our motivation or purpose in life in our darkest times sometimes. I don't wish it upon people but sometimes you can find that. And the fact that it's so important not to lose hope. And for me, that uh, not giving up on that hope, I came to the UK as a child refugee, and to cut that long story short was, um, as a child refugee with having no support and um, hardly any formal education, I carried on with that determination. But a third important factor, beside hope and, and not uh, giving up uh, on my dream, was the compassion that I received from the people in the UK who allowed me to work and study, ultimately for me to be able to go to Cambridge University and Harvard to become a doctor in 2010. Uh, and then I started working as a humanitarian. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, I think, mm. you know, we live in a world where, unfortunately, where people live, you know, sometimes can determine whether they live. Mm. And right now, there are over 360 million migrants who are across the world, and some millions more, you know, might be joining them very soon. You know, unfortunately, due to like several wars and conflicts, you know, in different areas. And if you have actually really been to an IDP camp before or a refugee camp before, you would notice that you know, it's not like our gated estates or like our very posh, you know, places where we live. You know, they they live in shelters like made of polythene, and. Um, in terms of like building innovation there, and that's one of the things I really love about the innovation that you're building, which is the, um, the Arian Tele Hill mm. uh, pro project, which uh, you're empowering doctors you know, to, uh, to treat and um, treat young people and then also elderly people mm. living in this um, migrant community and also people, other people in low resource communities. So how does the innovation, like how do you build the capacity of those who help uh, treat the community members. Thank you. So Arian Tallyheel is a UK registered charity. Uh, in its simplest form, it connects medics from the National Health Service in the UK and across the globe now to medics in conflict zone and in low resource settings using telemedicine, which is giving advice online, uh, specialist advice. By doing so, they're saving lives and they're increasing capacity providing education, whether it's case-based, whether it's through seminars. But the important fact in that is that the technology is an enabler. So when I say innovation, innovation is actually solving a problem. For me to be able to found Aaron Heal was understanding the problem. First of all, to have that deep uh, compassion and passion for the people to help them and understanding the people who are experiencing the problem. And secondly, using the collective compassion of other people here in the UK or across the globe who wanted to help. And then connecting these two was where the technology comes in. So that's quite at the lower stages that we, the, the solution becomes um, 
something that you have to work on towards the end once you understand the problem, the people, and the team who could help you with as well. Oh, great. Okay, so how do you think like international partners, like private organizations, because you, know, you talked a lot about like the compassion of people around you and then the institutions. So how do you get, how do you think we can really leverage institutional support? Because one thing I really know about global health programs, even as like a founder, the founder of Slum and Ra Health Initiative, an organization that also takes healthcare to you know, um, um, low resource settings in Nigeria. Um, one thing I've really discovered is like the funding really matters, right? And then also involving other agencies and corporations in delivering innovations also matters. So how, what do you think they can do you know, better or what do you think like these organizations can do more in terms of like being an active you know, influencer in reducing and bridging the gap in healthcare sure. equity? I think for bridging the gap, whether it's nationally in the UK, whether it's um, in low resource settings or anywhere, uh, it's through collaboration exactly what you've mentioned. Collaboration is the key that's between non-profits, between states, as well as between for-profit organizations and individuals. It's not if we expect non-profits to go on and change the world on their own, they can't do it. So that's where um, even working in, in, in conflict zone, I've realized that I had to work with the government. So most of work in Afghanistan, which we later on scaled to Syria, parts of Africa, India, uh, and other countries, relied heavily on that collaboration, that negotiation and diplomacy in order to be able to um, network with them and find synergistic areas of interest, not what we want, but what actually everybody around the table, the stakeholders want in order to help the people within the context. So then, again, coming to that point, to build a solution in the UK and try to then change the world in Africa, it's a very naive way of looking at things. So when people come to me and say, oh, I would like to go in and create them this amazing tech and I'm going to raise money, I'm going to do this. I am like, what is the problem you're solving? And the, the answer is not there. And that's where the, our focus has to be. The problem and the people and the stakeholders around it, networking around it. And fundraising technology is one part of it. I understand there are limitations, but that's how we can do it. The one aspect that's neglected heavily is mental health, which brings me to what I'm doing next is, uh, is the Aryan Wellbeing Venture. Uh, doing something similar to the charity, but through Aryan Wellbeing, we're bringing mental health experts, psychologists, therapists, PTs, everybody around, and providing that access to everybody, including hard to reach populations on smartphones. Because mental health is put at the back of the queue after the pandemic. Even in countries like such as the UK, I work in as a frontline medic, as an emergency doctor. I see people coming in with mental health crisis. And it really breaks my heart. And I personally have experience of post-traumatic stress coming from Afghanistan. So that's where I do have the deep connection with it. And I would like to solve the problem, not just for myself, but tens of millions of people who are suffering whether it's here, whether it's in low resource settings. In low resource settings, even access to mental health services is absolutely um, minimal. And so that's something that health, when we define health, it is physical and mental health as well as social well-being. Uh, uh, and that applies to not displaced people, but it applies to every one of us sitting in this room. And hence, when I was looking at that, uh, big vision that, yes, it's, we would like to tackle the mental health crisis, but we have to start somewhere. And that's where the Aaron Wellbeing launch uh, is in the UK, uh, hoping that one day we'll be able to reach hard-to-reach populations across the globe. Thank you very much. So I think uh, you've really raised very important points today. First, um, we can get the greater solutions from adversity. Um, very important that we collaborate and then work together with the government, you know, with stakeholders, with private sector, and even with the people, you know, to be able to build scalable solutions. Uh, you talked a lot about mental health and why it's very important. I really know that in low resource, for instance, a low resource country like Nigeria has over 200 million people and just about 250 psychiatrists. That's very. Wow. That's a very huge mm -hmm. gap. And most of these psychiatrists are based in far away tertiary hospitals mm -hmm. and um, in very, very like, dense you know, urban areas. So this is where like, you're all coming into this session. And we would love to like, 
get questions from you for Dr. Arian, who has been doing a very great, fantastic work in, um, in providing healthcare and bridging these um, global health inequalities, especially in low resource countries and in low resource settings. So uh, questions, please, from the audience, especially for Dr. Arian. And for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, guys, thanks a lot. Um, you talked a lot about your solution that relies on doctors within the UK giving their time and kind of like a one-to-one -one link to doctors in conflict-affected areas. Is, I was wondering what the role is for technology to um, kind of break that link between the personal one-to-one -one connection so that actually there doesn't have to be a person on the other side and it can just be, you know, technology can then potentially be a solution for something that doesn't rely on the UK doctors to give their time as possibly a way of, you know, is that something that you've explored? Is it a, a, a kind of viable solution for scaling this, this solution? Okay, so can we take one more question so that I can just answer them together and that's it? Okay, any other question? Okay, so. Hello everyone, it's Kauta from Morocco. So uh, I believe that if we want to have an impact uh, on our continent, in our society, it starts from the first society and the second society. What I mean by the first and the second, it's that our first is our families, our home, uh, where uh, we belong, and the second is that may, uh, the company that we are uh, representing our, or we are working on it. So if we want to have it, or ensure that mental health in the first and second society, how we can do actually do it, and what the action that we should, uh, we should as a human be develop to ensure that if Everyone had that mental health. Okay, so the question is about like what can we do personally yes. to have a better mental health well-being, and also how what can we do with our immediate family, sure. it's like our first it's a society, yeah, sure. uh, to, so, yeah. for so mental I'll, health. So I think uh, Dr. Arian will answer those questions, and then we'll wrap up the session. Uh, that's a very interesting question you, you, you raised there. I think you've alluded to artificial intelligence or something that how can we automate solutions. Uh, one thing I think we need to realize in medicine, and this has been tried uh, in America by many companies, and I don't want to name them, that they have, their vision has been that how we can create this automated uh, doctor. Um, I don't think actually technology works compatibly with doctors, uh, especially when it comes to mental health. You can't replicate emotions. And that's where it's the compatibility of technology. It's, a, it's going to be always a hybrid solution. And it's better to understand the limitation early on rather than go in an, into a, a loophole where later on you've designed something that doesn't work somewhere else. Yeah, I do believe technology has a great role. Um, for example, in diagnoses, uh, we've seen it in radiology, we've seen it that they can narrow down your differential diagnosis. I'm an uh, emergency medicine physician, so I could rely on that for a lot of things to focus my attention. But when, when it comes to, I'll give you an example, when it comes to me, speaking to a colleague who is distressed, he's just dealing with somebody who is six year old. Technology cannot reassure him. Technology can't actually tell him that it's okay, you've done everything you have. Even in medicine, when it comes to physical health aspect, emergencies, we can't take away the emotions from it. For me, a big part of dealing in the emergency department is dealing with the emotions of the patients. I spend actually 90% of my time is listening to the patient. And they tell me everything I need to know. But maybe the problem that they are suffering is they will not tell me until that connection, that relationship is built. So it's not just physical problem, chest. You've got a heart, lung, this. It could be anxiety. It could be grief. It could be something else. I had a similar situation where somebody came in with chest pain um, because their mom had passed away. And I realized that the blood tests were actually showing that it wasn't anxiety, there was something deeply wrong. And it took me so many investigations and reassuring him he wanted to self-discharge that there's something deeply wrong, let me scan you. And he had a fall he didn't realize two, three nights ago, and he'd punctured his entire spleen. He would have died if I had allowed him to go. So if you put that into algorithm, they go immediately down the route of, you know, oh, anxiety, blah, 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 all you have to take a deep breath, you'll be fine. It takes a human to understand another human. So I hope I've summarized it in that sense there, but it works compatibly. Um, and your question is, is really beautiful. I think 
the question about mental health is, again, where the solutions have gone wrong and the existing and why we come in with our innovative solution to uh, combine mind-body together, make it comprehensive with a proper assessment at the top, which is culturally responsive. A lot of the psychiatrists, psychologists, even in the UK, 87% are coming from a white background. They look at things from one lens, which is amazing, fantastic. But what about the populations who have got their own protective mechanism and risk factors, what are very different to somebody else? It's not about quick therapy, it's not about quick medication, they have their own place. But when it comes to prevention relapse or to make sure that there is, we tackle the root cause of the problems is where we have to pay attention to the people, as I mentioned in the beginning, to the families, the environment, the context. If they can't feed their children, how on earth do you expect them to put a smile you know, and, and say that, oh, I'm doing some meditation, I'll be fine? They won't be fine. So it's understanding those restraints, environmental restraints, and that's where the um, social factors come into play and where a comprehensive approach that revolves with specialists who are culturally trained can come in and support as much as possible. So I hope I've answered that. Thank you very much. So um, thank you everyone for being with us you know, through this very important session. I think uh, when we come to programs like this, uh, health inequities and uh, promoting health equality is very important. And it's very vital that we have this kind of discussions, you know, discussions about how we could put in the digital and then human factor together, you know, to be able to make a great product. Thank you so much for your brilliant contributions, for the questions. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Arian, for being uh, a wonderful presenter today and for really sharing your heart, you know, even with your speech and also your innovation with us. So I would really say thank you, everyone, for being a part of the session. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you so much.